Good afternoon. We're going to get started. Um, as you know, at the beginning of this year, we decided to um, uh, revise and upgrade our colloquia series. And uh, we named it after Elihu Katz. So you are now attending the Elihu Katz colloquium series. Uh, the new system has a number of uh, new pieces to it, but one of them is that. Uh, every semester, we hope to bring in three outside visitors to speak on various aspects related to communication, and three of our own Annenberg faculty to speak. And so today is the first of our insiders in the Elihu Katz Colloquium series, and it strikes me as being very appropriate that that person is Professor Joe Capella. As you all know, Professor Capella is the Gerald R. Miller Professor of Communication, uh, I could go on for quite some time about his many accomplishments, but let me just give you a brief overview of that. He's published more than 150 articles and book chapters, along with four co-authored books. His research has been supported by an alphabetic mix of federal agencies, <laughs> from the National Institute of Mental Health to the National Science Foundation to the National Cancer Institutes and several others that I admit I didn't have time to look up what the initials stood for but they include, well, I'll, I'll just go on to say that in addition to the federal grants that Joe has been a major contributor to, he's also received funding for his work from the 20th Century Fund and from the Markle, Ford, Carnegie, Pew, and Robert Wood Johnson Foundations. And having worked at Pew, in fact, worked with Pew um, as one of the funders for one of Joe's projects, I can tell you that working with foundations can be difficult. And getting grants from that many foundations is a real testimony to some aspect of Joe's qualities. I'm not sure which ones they are. <laughs> He's a fellow of the International Communication Association and is also the ICA's, one of the ICA's past presidents. He's a distinguished scholar of the National Communication Association. And I think this is important to note, a recipient of the B. Audrey Fisher Mentorship Award because Joe is not only a great scholar and researcher, but he is one of the most dedicated and, and effective teachers and mentors we have here, both at the graduate and undergraduate level. And he's also, for those of you who might not have this opportunity to know, one of the major leaders and voices on the Annenberg faculty in terms of the governance of the school. What I really want to say, though, is that for me, Joe defines what it means to be a communication scholar. His work is the epitome of interdisciplinarity, for example, the book he published with Kathleen Hall Jameson, The Spiral of, Cy of Cynicism, won both the Doris Graber Book Award from the Political Communication Division of the American Political Science Association and the Fellows Book Award from the International Communication Association. His articles have appeared, of course, in many of the top communication journals, but also in the top psychology, health studies, and political science journals. His research spans the areas of health and political communication, social interaction, nonverbal behavior, media effects, and statistical methods. But what I really want to say is that he approaches all this interdisciplinarity from the perspective of a communication scholar interested in communication processes, which allows him to cover such a wide range of substantive areas because communication is at the core. It took me a while to learn that. My background is in political science. I tended to approach the work that I do that is communication relevant from the point of view of a of politics and a political scientist. It was never always clear to me what it meant to be a communication scholar first and foremost, and I've learned what that means from Joe, among many of the other faculty here. And lastly, he is constantly innovating, always creating, always at the cutting edge. In the work that I do, his work on deliberation in online uh, settings is really fundamental to the quantitative and empirical work in deliberation. His talk today is called Building a Message Machine, Algorithms and Intuition as Viewed Through the Eyes of D.C. Dennett and Robert Pr Prissig. That includes the, uh, the, art, uh, the, uh, the Zen and Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, as well as an article, The Intentional Systems. So I, can see, I think you can see what I mean about Joe's creativity and innovation. 
So without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Joseph Capella. So there are <clears throat> advantages and disadvantages to having a, uh, an introduction like that. One yeah. is, one is you better be good <laughs> uh, to live up. And the other is if it's a, <clears throat> a low-end introduction, then you don't have as much to live, live up to. So I think I have to live up to some things here, and I'll do my best to do so. Um, it may seem that, um, you know, having been at this for quite a while, that <clears throat> there'd be uh, no uh, anxiety or concern about uh, delivering uh, talk like this. But in point of fact, I heard you guys are a tough crowd. <laughs> so. And having been on the other side of the podium uh, with you, I, uh, I understand that. So I'm going to do my best to uh, try to not embarrass myself and give you ample opportunity to uh, question, uh, raise questions that are of concern to you. Obviously, I tried to build, put a title here that would be provocative. And that was my uh, intention all along. But it uh, does give me a, a chance does give me a chance to uh, talk a little bit about some of the thoughts and ideas that have uh, influenced me over the course of my career. And I find myself going back to very, very early period in my career uh, to talk about two people whose uh, writings uh, influence the way I think about particular, about I think all the problems that I've tried to deal with in uh, my academic life. And these are the works of a philosopher of mine whose name is uh, D.C. Dennett and an author, uh, Robert Persig, who wrote a book that was uh, received a great deal of attention a long time ago called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Before I talk about these guys' influence, I want to talk about the influence of uh, some of the students and some of the colleagues that I've had over the course of time. Uh, I used to be able to put this on one page, and now we have to go on to two pages. Uh, and I've decided that one other thing I absolutely need are pictures uh, for each of the people who are here. But this is just the beginning of the list of people who are faculty, students, uh, postdocs, uh, research directors, who have helped not just with this, the data that I'm going to talk about today and the, and the uh, results that I'm going to talk about today, but um, have. Uh, giving me the chance to uh, learn a lot from them about a lot of other things as well. I uh, keep talking in our research team meetings about things like collective intelligence, and I really mean that that's what happens in those research meetings. That's the first list, and this is the uh, second list of, uh, of people. Not that they are second class or belong on a secondary list, but they are um, just didn't make it onto the first page. I would point out a couple of things on this group here. We have uh, two other people on the list who have uh, made some contributions specifically to today's talk. Uh, one is a good friend of mine and colleague, Peter Manje from USC, and a graduate student of his who uh, took on a challenge that um, we circulated uh, or later uh, in the latter part of this summer, Pung Oh. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about his data if we ever get there and I stop babbling on. Um, so when I was a, an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin, the very first year, uh, the first doctoral student I had, Joe Folger, said, hey, hey, Joe, he said, this is a book I think you'll love. He said, you should read it, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. I said, oh, my God, motorcycle maintenance? Come on, what does he think? I ride a bicycle, but I'm not a motorcycle guy. <laughs> and he was absolutely right. I thought it was a brilliant piece of work, uh, and I'll try to tell you why in just, in just a minute. When I was a graduate student, uh, one of the people who influenced me a great deal was Don Cushman. Donald Cushman was a debate coach um, and somebody who taught a lot about the philosophy of science. And he would read widely. And um, he would bring things down to the office and hand them to me and stand over me while I read them. <laughs> he would say, here, Capella, you've got to read this. All right. So one day he comes in and he gives me an article by D.C. Dennett that uh, had been published in, uh, where was it published? In the Journal of Philosophy in 1971. I know that seems like it was a previous uh, era, like the Pleistocene era, but it was actually a long time ago. But it was an important article. He, he would hand me the article and he'd say, Capella, read this. He'd let me go for maybe five minutes, and then he would say, 
never mind, never mind. He makes three points <laughs> of everything that, and he would then tell me what those three points were, and so I didn't have to read the article anymore, <laughs> which led to a significant problem because the first thing that I ever published, um, which was in the Journal of Philosophy and Rhetoric, yes, Philosophy and Rhetoric, a human, humanities journal, part of the reason I got the job at Wisconsin in the first place, um, I misspelled Dennett's name and called him Bennett. And so the entire article is about somebody called D.C. Bennett, who is, you know, those were the days when you actually published articles, you, you, you read, you know, you looked at Xerox copies. Well, they were a mess, right? So you kind of looked at them quickly, Dennett, Bennett, it's all the same. I went back and looked at that article this morning, it's D.C. Bennett, constantly D.C. Bennett. Yes, it's just published that way. So I, I, when, uh, when Mr. Dennett looks up for his influence, looks up, uh, you know, references to himself uh, in terms of the influence that he's uh, 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 had on the field of communication, he won't find his influence, at least on, at least on me. Um, but I took, a, I took some important lessons from each of these works, and I'm being funny about them, but they were serious lessons and ones that I thought um, helped me think about who I was as a scholar and the way in which I wanted to attack problems. Um, Persig's book, which by the way, for those of you who have had things rejected, was rejected by 121 publishers before it was finally published. Um, and uh, when it was published, it was a big hit, made bestseller list and so on. And it's, it's a book about a motorcycle trip, but it's really a book about philosophy. And it's really a book about the philosophy of science. And he, he, <clears throat> he takes his son across the country on a motorcycle trip and goes with another uh, uh, couple called the Sutherlands. The Sutherlands are the romantics. And um, the narrator, in this case, is Persig. Uh, it's pretty much considered to be an auto, a fictional autobiography, uh, is the classicist. And by, um, and, and what Persig contrasts as he goes across the country are all kinds of things about philosophical issues. But the core one that made a lot of difference to me was how you repair a motor, how, how you treat a motorcycle. Persig said, I need to, he had an old motorcycle. He said, I, I need to understand my motorcycle so that when it's not working properly, I want to be able to fix it. I want to be able to take it apart. I want to be able to, um, tweak what needs to be tweaked so that the motorcycle will work better. The Sutherlands, on the other hand, could care less about how the motorcycle worked. They only cared about the beauty of the motorcycle. The, the, they had a modern one. Um, they uh, only wanted to derive pleasure from riding the motorcycle. And so in some senses, what you have is this contrast between, I need to understand how it works so that I can fix it when it goes bad, and also, by the way, so I won't be at the mercy of unscrupulous mechanics uh, who, when they tell me that <clears throat> uh, something needs to be fixed, I can double, double check them. So the lesson I took away from the narrator, at least initially, by the way, the narrator sort of changes his view over the course of the, of the book and becomes a little more romantic by the end and, and tries to understand the juxtaposition and the importance of both of these points of view of the romantic and the classical. But he begins by being a classicist, by being someone who says, really, to understand how a motorcycle works, you must be able to fix it, take it apart, put it back together again. And the, and the gold standard for him is to actually build a motorcycle, which in some senses he does because it's an ancient, it's this ancient machine that he has. The Sutherlands, on the other hand, have an appreciation for the beauty, the pleasure, the delight that comes from riding the motorcycle that they have, and the narrator less so. And it's that juxtaposition that meant a lot to me because I felt a close affinity with Persig, with the narrator in this case, because I said to myself, I want to know how things work. I want to be able to fix them when they break. I want to make them a little better if they're not doing what they need to need to do. And so in that sense, that ability to intervene is um, uh, part of what has driven the way I think about problems and the kinds of solutions that I try to bring about in, in handling those problems. But that does create uh, an interesting separation between the subject and the object of, of being studied. And so you distance yourself. And so you, you separate yourself. You become um, uh, the object becomes apart from you. And in some real sense, <clears throat> something else that I've written in, uh, I don't know if Klaus is here. Yes, he is. Excellent. 
in, a, in an absolutely brilliant speech that he gave as president of, of uh, ICA when he left, uh, he talked about how it is that scientists work their science. It's by construction. It's by imposition. It's by creating the realities that they are trying to understand. And you can't do that by being apart, totally apart. You can't objectify in that way. You need to be near. You need to be close. You need to appreciate in some way the way the Sutherlands did, the character of their uh, world that they were trying, that they, that they were taking pleasure from. But they st you still need to be the narrator because sometimes the machine breaks, right? You need to be able to fix things, make them better, make them more effective. But what about, what about Dennett? What did I take from Dennett? Well, something very similar. Not so much in terms of classical and romantic styles, but really in terms of the stance that you take with respect to problems that you're seeking to solve, whether these problems are problems of uh, explanation, problems of prediction, or whatever, whatever that might be. Dennett, in his very early 1971 piece, which later became a full-fledged book, argues that you can approach problems in lots of different ways. And um, the question is not necessarily which of these approaches is the correct approach, but rather which of these approaches works best with the questions that you want to answer. And so his, his most famous example out of that 1971 piece, and one that those of you who have taken classes with me have heard about from time to time, is the idea of playing chess and playing chess with, <coughs> uh, a, with something. You don't know what the something is. Is the something a computer? Is the something a person? And so on. What stance should you take with respect to that, that machine? That, sorry, that thing you're playing, <laughs> playing chess with. Should you treat it as if it's a person? Well, if you want to play the game, if you want to uh, win, if you want to advance the, the notion of, uh, uh, of success in this, in this context, then you had best treat whatever you're interacting with as if it has purposes and goals, like defending the center of the board, making sure that you can castle uh, when you need to and you're in, in, uh, in danger, uh, treating that system as intentional. Okay? But if you want to improve the quality of play of that system, by treating it as if it were an intentional being, it isn't going to get you anywhere. You're going to need to get into the programming instructions. You're going to need to be able to say, you need to fix this. Here's how you're going to protect the center of the board. Here's what you need to do, and here are the conditions under which you're going to need to maintain the, uh, the, uh, the castling uh, uh, condition. If you want the machine to run faster, if you want the machine to use less energy, if you want the machine to be able to play against 100 players simultaneously, you've got to take a different stance, a stance at the level of the microscopic, the, almost the subatomic, the, 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 uh, the quantum level in some ways. A physical stance. Now, which of these stances is right? They're all right. Okay, they're all right. But the the issue is, which questions do you want to answer? And so, if I stay with Persig, and I say I really want to be able to make sure that my machine is operating to its best, I want to be able to improve the quality of my machine, my motorcycle. Then I at least need to operate at a design at a design stance because I have to be able to get in there and, and fix some things. I may not have to be down there right at the molecular level uh, to make my machine run properly, but I need to be able to uh, intervene to make things work. So that's why I use the metaphor here of um, building a message machine. I actually have a subfolder in my folders at school that says message machine, all right? It was empty pretty much. <laughs> um, there were a couple of entries in it, but uh, it's still there, all right? So there's a slot to be filled. Today I take the chance to fill some of that, uh, some of that slot. So initially my approach to messages as, as a classicist in Persig's sense, all right? Um, but also taking from all aspects of Dennett's work to the intentional from asking people about what kind of messages work for them and why, but not just, not just trusting what they say, okay, and taking that to be the only place to go, but actually saying, okay, if that's what you think is the case, let me try that out and 
and let's see what really happens. Okay, let's see what actually takes place. And then eventually, if we can discover some rules that uh, uh, allow us to see which kinds of messages in principle might be more effective than other kinds of messages, we'd like to explain those rules. It's one thing to have rules. It's one thing to have facts. It's another thing to explain them in ways that are sensible and that um, participate in existing knowledge and theories. So my goal is to build a message science. All right? And if you're going to build a message science, if you're going to fix your motorcycle, you've got to have tools. So one of the things we've spent a lot of time on, many of you in this audience have spent many careers already uh, on helping us design tools for testing message effectiveness. We'll talk a little bit about some of those tools. Secondly, we're going to want to get at principles, rules, if you will, the, the, the design stance in uh, Dennett's view, the um, motorcycle um, uh, mechanisms in Persig's, Persig's view. And then finally, we're going to want to at least be in the business of trying to understand those facts uh, if we can deduce any of them or induce them from the work that we do. So first, let's talk about tools. We've got to develop some tools. And <clears throat> I'm going to try not to do too many numbers here, but at some point, there'll be some numbers. Okay. Um, we, we work with real world messages. We don't uh, work with created messages. Yeah, sometimes we create some, but mostly we don't. Mostly we've been working with public service announcements in the anti-smoking area because that's where our funding is, but we've also done work with uh, anti-drug messages, political messages, and in an earlier uh, uh, manifestation, uh, worked with nonverbal kinds of messages in, in interpersonal kinds of contexts. Um, we try to build tools that will be good tools, that are efficient, that are reliable, and that are valid. So that's where we're going with the tools that, that we're trying to, trying to create. And what we're trying to do with these tools is evaluate messages. Be able to say, this is a pretty good one, this is not such a good one. This one is somewhere in between. And here's why, here's what its characteristics are that lead us to have messages which are effective versus not. They're all, so, so one of the ways of doing this, of course, is to say let's test every single message that we are interested in with the appropriate target population. We give them the message, we have a control group in which they don't get the message. And we look to see uh, how they responded to the message, whether the behavior was changed in the appropriate direction. Guess what? That is ridiculously costly. It's ridiculously uh, difficult to carry out. Our resources would be stretched to the limit. And while it might be a reliable and valid way to go for any kind of message testing, it's definitely not efficient. So we need a shortcut, OK? We have to find ways of doing this in, a way, in, in, more, in simpler ways than uh, that kind of gold standard test, if you will. We also take an approach that is like Persig's in that we're going to take the message apart. The first thing that you got to do when you repair something is you got to see what the linkages are, what the parts are, how they break apart. And of course, in some real sense, uh, we, there's no joints to carve messages at, although I think we have our sense. So we're going to decompose. And we're going to decompose in two ways. We're going to take a message and break it out into its, its content, if you will, uh, in terms of the argument that it makes. And now, remember, we're talking about PSAs here. So some of what I'm saying is really just specific to PSAs and maybe isn't going to work so well for, uh, you know, for uh, larger, larger scale documents. Break it apart into its uh, argument and the way that argument is presented or its format, uh, if you will. Um, we will measure things like how strong the argument is. We will uh, measure the overall effectiveness of the message itself. Okay? And we will code a whole variety of features, formatting features for that, for that message in the audio arena and in the video uh, arena. And once we've broken out these pieces, we're going to try to pull them all back together again in ways that, that make sense. So this is analysis and synthesis. It's exactly what it is. Now, you might say, aren't you breaking apart the gestalt? Aren't you? And the answer is absolutely. That's exactly what we are doing for good or for, or for ill. Graphically, it looks something like this. We take some message like a PSA, a video, audio, PSA, usually 30 seconds, a minute, maybe a little longer. We pull the argument out. 
Um, I'll give you some examples of this in just a second. People rate that argument. Do I have a pointer here? I do. Oh, look at, oh, look at that. Fantastic. Uh, I, I actually like this pointer better. <laughs> it's right at my fingertips. Um, the other one I'll probably throw somewhere. So, anyway, the argument gets, gets pulled apart from the message. It gets rated by people. Sometimes we do computerized text analysis with the message. The message is also coded in terms of its format features, a whole bunch of them. Little Fs, all right? Um, where, do, where do we, what, what leads us to break the message apart in these, in these kinds of ways? Well, obviously, it, that's completely open process. The number of features that one could look at in a message is infinite. Uh, it's just up to, as Klaus points out, the constructive abilities of, of the theorist. So we have uh, sought help in this regard, and so three theories have helped us. One, of course, is the elaboration likelihood model. This is a little bit of alphabet soup, all right? Um, the elaboration likelihood model, which says to us, argument strength is really crucial in persuasion. Uh, we need to understand the strength of the arguments that are being made. Uh, Annie Lang's theory, LC4MP, um, let's see, those, what is it? Um, limited, limited capacity, uh, motivated, mediated message processing, at one less M that, that there is here. Uh, but importantly, uh, what Annie has done is to develop, uh, develop some features of messages that are called uh, the information introduced after camera changes and uh, the uh, information introduced after audio changes. So this kind of information intr introduced becomes uh, codable features of uh, audio and video messages. And the third is uh, Amy, the uh, automated model of uh, information exchange. Um, and from uh, the Kentucky group, uh, Donahue and Palm Green, and they've looked at uh, about a dozen or so features called message sensation value that seem to be related to attention, cognitive resources that are related to uh, information introduced, and argument strength related to things like acceptance of the, of the, underlying, of the underlying argument. So we haven't made all this up, but uh, we've looked to others to help us think about how to break messages into their, into their parts. Um, we usually get a sample of messages. Today we'll talk mostly about a set of 200 messages that we have done extensive work with. Uh, we will often randomly select that, so a given person might get four, six, 12, depends on uh, how difficult the task is. From that set of, of messages that we happen to be working with, they get them in random order. So. Any particular message is never just first or second or third in the system. It can be any one of those processes. And the evaluators are always from the target population that we're interested in. So if we're looking at anti-smoking messages, guess what? We use smokers, all right? Or former smokers. We don't use um, non-smokers, even though they might be relevant for some particular kind of, of question. OK, so the procedures that we're using is we're letting people evaluate multiple messages. We're doing it with self-report kinds of, kinds of approaches. This doesn't sound like it necessarily will work. I mean, after all, if you, if you evaluate message one in position one, is that going to be different from when it's in position two and position three, blah, blah, blah? The short answer is not really. Uh, there are no real strong position effects uh, in, in this work. We have one study that showed initial evaluations of the same message appearing in different positions is a little less favorable uh, early on. This is an example of that. This is a study in which people evaluated eight arguments, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Here's the, the mean argument strength, and these are the means um, for those arguments uh, when they're in position, when that argument is in position, uh, when the arguments are in position one, two, et cetera. They're very small initial effects uh, here, but not uh, when there are effects, but mostly there are no such effects. All right, how many evaluations do we need? Do we need the, you know, do we need a thousand? Do we need a hundred? Do we need 10? Do we need 50? What do we need uh, to evaluate? And the short answer is 23. <laughs> you're laughing, you're laughing, you're laughing, but we, right, Minji, 23. You'll not, because Minji did all this analysis. So uh, if you look across here as the number of evaluators per message, all right, if it's up here at around 40, what we've got in this top graph is um, this is the uh, percentage of bootstrap samples in which there is no error in assigning something in the top group versus uh, having it 
assigned to the bottom group. Well, by the time you're up at 40, it's, 100, it's perfect, okay? No misspecifications, um, and uh, most of the samples have zero misspecification. If you go down to around 23 or so, you're doing pretty well, okay? You're doing pretty well. So, so I'm sorry, yes, I'm sorry. So you have a set of, say, 200 messages, okay? Um, so the misspecification would be um, the sample um, uh, puts the message in the top group versus puts it in the bottom group, all right? So a misspecification would be, I think this message is in the top group and it gets put into the, into the bottom group. Well, that happens, okay, when you're down here around five, seven, or nine. That's a pretty, pretty decent probability that it's gonna be misspecified down here, see? Right, it's, it's like 40 or 50%. But by the time you get to 23 to 25 evaluators, all right, there's almost no chance of you assigning something to the bottom group when it should be in the top group. That's all, it, that's all this is. So this is a good tool, is all, is all I'm saying. All right, it's all a self-report tool. Does it, is that self-report of message effectiveness, which is a judgment, perceived message effectiveness, is it related to anything we care about, such as the intention to quit smoking? And the short answer is it is. Um, we've done at least, uh, we've done a couple of studies. And this is a result across two different studies, a uh, paper published by Betsy Bigsby uh, and communication monographs, in which we look at the overall, uh, the overall intention that uh, is uh, predicted from the aggregate perceived effectiveness of the messages that people got, and that's a significant relationship and not inconsequential. Uh, reducing the number of cigarettes a day, same, talk to somebody about quitting, same. same. The weakest one is completely and permanently, in, which is the most difficult criterion, of course, uh, in the next 30 days. Um, so over, overall, it's a tough criterion for something like smoking. So we're not talking about, you know, are you willing to eat fewer chocolate chip cookies? I mean, this is giving up an addiction. Uh, so uh, it's a pretty, it's a pretty, pretty good mallet, a, a, a set of tools. It's reliable, it's efficient, and I think it's valid. I think we've got tools that we can use, and we have been. All right. So if you're not going to let me do that, if you're going to stop me there, then I'm just going to sit down because I have nothing else to say to you. <laughs> All right. Um, now, now we want to go to facts. Now we want to go to principles. What kinds of facts? I'm going to tell you what we're going to find. Uh, and then I'm going to show you what we found. And then I'm going to tell you what we found, all right? Um, journalistic principles of the highest, highest order. I'm going to tell you that argument strength matters, that formats that engage people's cognitive resources, when those cognitive resources are directed at the core content of the message, are the kind of format features that matter. And that sometimes, under some circumstances, cognitive attention can lead to something bad happening, distraction, from the core content to something irrelevant. It's like, you know, I saw this message and they stuck something else in there that, you know, drew my attention, but it was not what the message was about. And you say, that's a bad message. And the answer is, that's right. That's a bad, that's a bad message. So that's what we're gonna be going after. Core content and, and engagement devices, engagement vehicles, if you will formats that are going to push people in the direction of engaging with that uh, core content. But, and here's the, here's the rub, I want to fix the motorcycle. I want to build the motorcycle. So I'm going to stay with features of the message that are objective in the sense that I can grab one and say, put it in, take it out. Now. I'll get pretty close to that in most circumstances. There are a few places where I don't, and you should call me on it, and then we can talk. But, but we're trying to talk about design features, things we can manipulate, not general senses. Now, these things that we want to manipulate should have a consequence for perceived effectiveness. That's where we want to go, but they need to be objective, objective features. So what we're trying to do is to build a science of uh, message effects using features that can be manipulated. Let's go right to the bottom line, all right? I won't, I'll give you the regression in a little bit, and then you can all, those of you who want to nod off at that time can do that, but, <laughs> but I'm going to give you some more, slightly more qualitative kinds of, kinds of findings. Across a set of <clears throat> 200 PSAs that we have been looking at extensively, here are three of the top five arguments 
These are arguments extracted from these PSAs. They are not the PSA itself. It's not word for word. It's a kind of coherent summary of what is in that argument, is, is in that PSA, both in audio, dialogue, and to some extent what's in the visuals. So top three, sorry, three of the top five, smoking doesn't just kill you. It causes cancers that can be disfiguring, like having a hole in your neck or part of your face removed surgically. You can imagine what that video shows. I can show it to you, but I'm not going to take the time. All right, but it's going to be a hole in the neck, and it's going to be somebody who's gotten mouth cancer and had lost a good portion of their jaw. Uh, but that's the argument. That's the argument that's made. It's not, it's not the emotional part of it. It's not the intense part of it, but it's, it's there. Look at the bottom, top of the bottom five, if you will. Cigarette companies and advertising executives don't care about the facts that cigarettes are dangerous and can kill you. To them, it's a big joke. This is an uh, uh, argument against tobacco companies, which, of course, was part of uh, the legacy campaign directed at young people, and that was a very effective campaign. Here, with adult smokers, doesn't work. Okay? Just like cosmetic appeals, which work with young people, don't work with older, older, um, older smokers. So these are what the uh, these are a couple of examples of the uh, of the best uh, best of show, so to speak, and and the worst of show. Here are some of their characteristics. Right here is perceived effectiveness of the entire PSA. Well, obviously the top five are going to be more effective than the bottom five. No news there. But look what else you see. You also see that the top five have. Um, the strongest uh, arguments in terms of ratings by others, whereas the bottom five have less strong arguments. Um, the top five have more positive emotion and more negative emotion. They have more emotion, pure and simple. And not graphed here because this is a quantitative uh, thing, is, is whether the, they tell a story or not. And four out of the top five tell a story. Zero out of five in the bottom group tell a story. So you know where this is going. Argument strength emotion, narrative. That's where we're going. And we're going there because that's what the rest of the data say when we look at it uh, more carefully. I, I'm not going to do Rick Stoddard. Now, if you don't like numbers, now is the time to avert your eyes. <laughs> this, this is a new, this is a new, I know, I know it's a new thing in academe, right, where you're supposed to warn people in advance that you're going to be in a course that does a lot of, you know, nasty, nasty presentations, uh, whether it's a course about pornography or violence or whatever it's going to be, and so you're supposed to warn the audience in advance. I'm warning, I'm warning you. Okay? What's a checkbook? Hey, look, it, I, I just told you about an article done in 1971, all right? So, you know, you understand what's going on. So we don't have big data. We have big-ish data. It's sort of big-ish. We have uh, big-ish. It's 200, PS, uh, 200 PSAs extensively worked. About 2,500 smokers uh, make <clears throat> each of them evaluating four PSAs. It's about 10,000 observations. Um, I'm going to talk to you about only one class of findings here today, and then I'll move away from it in just a bit, and that's the population-level responses. That is the aggregate response to the ad by those who viewed it. Not, the, it, not, not, not Zelizer's response to the ad, but the class of people who evaluated that ad. All right? Later, we want to, we want to worry about whether, whether uh, Barbie's response to that ad is like the aggregate response or deviates from it. That's going to be an important issue, but that's, that's coming up later. Now, we've got a lot of formal features, uh, format features to look at. And so part of what we have done is we have looked to cluster those format features uh, and into uh, various kinds of groups. Uh, CJ has done a lot of work with that, and he doesn't want to see another uh, clustering program ever again. <laughs> I, I know that for a fact because he just he, he leaves the room whenever we talk about clustering. <laughs> uh, but for example, uh, one of the things that we saw was that um, a measure of visual activation, uh, the name has changed over time. It says visual discontinuity, but it's visual activation. Uh, uh, empirically groups together into the number of edits in, the, in there, the number of faces, whether there's a camera change, how many camera changes, whether there's an emotion change, object change, perspective change. All of these things group together to give us a single measure of visual activation, which is good because instead of having 50 separate uh, predictors, we have essentially uh, one in this case. And here's where the numbers come up. Um, what I'm presenting you here are simply the 
uh, the, uh, essentially the correlations in, in the first column and then the full model of all of the features uh, together. Uh, and the, the stars have kind of disappeared, and I apologize for that. Um, but argument strength is still a strong, we're predicting perceived effectiveness. Argument strength is a uh, significant predictor of perceived effectiveness. It's a very strong predictor uh, in the absence of other features, but uh, it remains in the presence of all of those features as well. Visual activation works in the opposite direction, in the opposite direction. All right. The more visual activation there is, the less effective the ad is seen to be, which is exactly the opposite of what the studies in Kentucky have shown with young people uh, in, in, in the anti-drug domain. Um, audio activation is just borderline. Special visual effects, not significant. Uh, special audio effects, big negative effect at <coughs> um, when it's uh, by itself, goes away in the presence of other features. What stays? What stays are the presence of characters and telling a story. A story can be acted out, a story can be told, but it's a story. And that effect is uh, a strong effect in that model. And so is the presence of <clears throat> fear and guilt. Positive emotion has dropped out of here because it's only in three out of, out of four of our studies. And as a consequence, uh, we have to deal only with negative emotion across the 200, 200 findings. Um, and then Smoking cues. Uh, turns out that smoking cues seem to be positively associated with, uh, with uh, the uh, perceived effectiveness outcome. I'm not going to talk about that because um, we're pretty sure that's an artifact of something else. All right, I'm not going to tell you why. So here's what we learned. Argument strength, negative emotional appeals, visual activation going in the other wrong direction, and narrative in the presence of characters are the, the three, four big predictors. You say, well, what about all of the interactions between these and other things? Well, first of all, we have no reason to look at all of these interactions because there's way too many. But we did look at a subset of interactions between argument strength, strong arguments, presented in certain ways. The notion here would be if you have a strong argument and you get a lot of attention to that strong argument, wouldn't that be enhanced? And if you had a weak argument and you had a lot of attention to a weak argument, wouldn't that lead to undermining the ad? The short answer is there's a few such effects. They, are, they add almost nothing to the variance explained. We explain in these aggregate data, we explain, <clears throat> um, sorry, we explain about 64% of the variance, which is a lot. Um, if you add these interaction effects, you add another slightly less than 1%. All right, so it's sort of not worth even, even thinking about, about those. Um, and so, um, one of the things that is fair to ask is, do we have a, a robust set of findings in the ones that I've just presented to you? And I think the answer to that is absolutely. I mean, one of the things we want to ask about our data all the time is not just did we find something, but did we find something that we can count on? I mean, after all, if I'm riding up a hill and my motorcycle breaks down, all right, I want to make sure that when I fix it, there's a robustness to that fixing, that it's done right. Similarly, if I'm going to put a message out there that's going to uh, supposedly be effective, we don't want that message to boomerang. We don't want to spend a lot of money uh, for that message if it isn't going to work. And I think the short answer here is I'm not going to go through all the details, but we've got lots of other evidence that suggests, for example, that argument uh, strength is a very um, robust kind of effect, uh, as is negative emotion. By the way, um, one of the things I do want to say about negative emotion and argument strength is I don't see these as terribly different from each other. And here's why. A lot of the uh, negative emotional appeals that are used, and, and emotional appeals in general that are used in these PSAs, are literally that. They are appeals. So they, they tell you about threats. They, they illustrate the threats, but they're telling you about threats. And so in that sense, I think they participate with arguments <clears throat> in ways to enhance them. We don't see these two effects as undermining each other. They both stay in our models simultaneously. And then when we look at other studies in which we've looked at high and low argument strength, uh, we see uh, that they function exactly the way that we think they would, including in, in brain responses, including uh, effects on uh, cotinine, which is an indicator of, of whether you've uh, smoked cigarettes in the ensuing month after viewing high versus low uh, argument strength PSAs. All of these studies are ones that we've been involved with. And uh, Andrew Strasser, elevated heart rate and skin conductance in presence of, uh, of high argument strength. 
What about engagement? So I think argument strength is a robust finding. Um, and <clears throat> I would argue that uh, we have a tremendous amount of evidence about narratives and exemplars as good indicators of the effectiveness of um, persuasive, uh, persuasive messaging. And we're getting more and more evidence that says that simply the presence of characters, which clearly goes hand in hand with narrative. A lot of times if you're, you know, if you're telling a story or if you're acting it out, you have characters. And so we've gone to a measure that includes both characters and narrative simultaneously. But this uh, effect is a very important effect, and it's an effect that is pretty consistent in uh, the work that, that uh, we have done uh, and that other people have done as well. Uh, there is a study uh, that uh, appeared in the American Journal of Public Health on um, uh, various kinds of anti-smoking messages and their consequences for cessation behaviors, not just perceived effectiveness, not just intentions to quit, but actual behavioral change, uh, at least reported behavioral change in smoking. And three factors played into that. The strength of the ad, which to us would be emotion in some ways, as well as argument strength, um, and the presence of narrative. So those two factors were crucial factors that played into the most effective uh, uh, kinds of impact on smoking, smoking cessation. Um, so engagement is uh, this notion that, that if more attention is paid to the con core content of the message, won't that enhance the, the message's uh, effectiveness? And the answer is yes, if the attention is directed at the core content, but probably not if it's a distraction, if it pulls your attention away from uh, the core content. And so those are two things that we, that we want to look at. Narrative that uh, certainly functions uh, when it's uh, well designed. Uh, to draw attention to the core content. I mean, you can tell a story that's irrelevant to the core content, but boy, that would be a really badly designed message. And we're using real messages that are being put together by people out of the ad industry, uh, often for pro bono purposes, and so we expect those messages to be pretty, um, pretty effective um, in terms of the, the linkage between the narrative and the, and, the, uh, and the core content. This notion of activation undermining the effectiveness of messages is consistent with several other findings that we've, that we've had. In the anti-drug area, uh, Yahoo Kang did, her dis, did, did some uh, work that showed that high MSV ads dampened the effect of strong arguments for, for kids. That high MSV, and this would be high activation kinds of ads, activated facial corrugator. That's the one, that's the one where, where people are making a sort of a negative face uh, in response to their, their, uh, uh, their uh, making a, the, the corrugator is associated with uh, um, uh, a sadness mouth, okay? It's this, it's the muscle here from the uh, upper part of the jaw to the corner, corner of the mouth. It also depressed uh, efficacy. Um, they also tended to uh, dampen core brain attention regions in a study by Dan uh, Langlebin that we were, uh, we were involved in <clears throat> and reduced, uh, reduced recognition. Long story short is we've got other data which says to us that uh, some of this kind of high activation kinds of messaging uh, can undermine the effectiveness of those messages for a variety of, a variety of reasons, and that is um, most, un most unfortunate, and we've certainly seen that as a main effect across these 200, these 200 messages. So we're explaining about 64% of the variance uh, at, the, uh, at the population level, um, but that's not the whole story. Because once you look at the population level, you can ask, where's all the variation in the response? Is it in the response to the message, or is it in a person's response to the message? And what we see in all of our data is that the individual variation in perceived effectiveness is huge in contrast to how much variation there is across messages. Factor of 20, approximately. 20 times more variation at the individual level than at the message level. Now, what that means is that while the aggregate responses are good, I think, I mean, think about this from the point of view of movies and books and things like that, right? Are there bestsellers? Yeah. Do you like all the bestsellers? No. <laughs> Do you read trash that nobody else reads? Yeah. <laughs> That's what we have here, okay? There's a bestseller list. That's the population level. Now, given the bestseller list, what about 
uh, all this variation across that bestseller list. That's what we have here. I've given you the top five and the bottom five. Those are the best sellers and the ones that shouldn't be on the bestseller list. But individuals respond to these in, in quite varied sorts of ways. Now the question is, can we deal with that in some interesting way? And uh, we're trying to. Um, so for example, suppose we take, go to the individual level, but before we do the analysis that we, like the one I just showed you, before we do that, suppose we take out the population level effect. If we do that, there's still individual effects there. Argument strength still affects, um, still associated with perceived effectiveness, but it's, it's half as strong. Um, same with character and narrative. All right? And here's what, the, here's what it looks like. It looks like this. Here's the data for when the population effects are present. This is uh, no characters, no narrative. Here's just characters. Here's characters and narrative. Stage of change is leave me alone. Whoops. Stage of change uh, in the white bars is uh, stage of change about smoking. Uh, I'm not interested in changing. All right, that's the bottom group. Uh, I'm sort of thinking about it. Okay, maybe pretty soon I'm going to do this. I'm planning. I'm making. So that's what this is. Obviously, a stage of change goes up. The, the effectiveness of the message is, is, more, is more positive. This is what it looks like at the population level, aggregate level of PE. If we take out the population level effects and we look at the same relationship, it's still there. But notice what happens here with the low stage of change. Almost nothing going on. It's whereas you had a slight increase here for the low stage of change here, nothing at all. But for the, uh, those who are more along the line, it's, it's still present. My point is nothing more than, than this. What's happening here is that there, is, uh, st there are still some effects at the individual level, even after the uh, population level uh, of effects are taken out. Joe. I have a question. Yes, sir. By population effects action, you mean you're tracking each person across different messages? So we have each person across messages. The population would be, what's the aggregate score of that message? Now we take that out first. And so we're actually predicting the deviation of that person's score from an average score. Either it's weighted or it's a different score, but in this case, it's, usually, it's weighted. Um, this brings us to recommendation systems. All right? Remember our bestseller example, right? You got bestsellers, population level, variation in those bestsellers. Well, if you go online, right, what happens when you go online to Amazon and you pick all of the New York Times top 10 bestsellers? You know the next time what they're going to give you, all right? The new bestsellers in the top top ten list. But if you're reading all that, you know, the, all the trash uh, romance uh, novels, you know, from uh, wherever, um, that's what you're that's what you're going to get. So your variation is going to become a part of this process. So part of what we want to do next is to try to make that variation become a part of the process. And one of, there are lots of ways of doing it. One is in terms of content similarity. Okay, so you like certain kinds of bestsellers. So Capella goes online and they're going to give him sort of fictional philosophical accounts of motorcycles. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and that's what, that's what he's going to see uh, uh, in the books that, that, uh, that he gets. But then other people who have read Persig's book have read other books, right? And they're going to start telling me, hey, you know other folks who read uh, Persig's book that, um, and they liked it and you, and you liked it? They also chose this book. You know that, right? And, and so we get a collaborative recommendation from all this. So one of his kind of recommendations is content-based, and the other is collaborative. If you like the message, suppose we apply this to messages. If you like the message that somebody else did as well, then you'll also like what they liked. All right? That's, that's the idea. So... This is the problem that we've been addressing recently, and this is where Pung and Peter uh, have uh, given us some little bit of traction in how this might, this might work. And they have helped us by building a fairly simple one-step recommender system. Uh, and we know that if two people have evaluated the, the same message, and if they're similar in their evaluations by some rule, for example, they both kind of, kind of liked it, 
or if they're dissimilar, they both kind of disliked it, then we either say they have a positive relationship because of what they held together, uh, because they're similar evaluations, or they have a negative relationship because they're, they're dissimilar. So now what we can do is we can, yeah? They would be dissimilar if one liked it and one didn't. Yes. Did I, did I say the opposite? Yeah, I'm going so fast, I don't know what I'm saying anymore. <laughs> um, but if I lose up five more minutes, then you're never going to get to ask me any questions. <laughs> I know you guys. You guys are mean, mean. Um, the, um, so we have one step positives who should produce a positive correlation to the average score given to any, any, any uh, um, uh, message. And the one step dissimilars uh, or the one step negatives uh, should have a negative correlation. It looks kind of like this. All right, you've got persons one two, three, and four, and in this case, um, person, person I and, and person one have a similar rating uh, score, so they're plus ones, and uh, person uh, I and person four have fairly different uh, rating scores, and so they get a negative one. But we can do this at a second step. We can do this beyond that, but we're not gonna. All right, and that is, I has, <coughs> um, some messages that they've looked at in common with person one, but then one has, look, has some messages in common with person five and with person six. So now we build a model. And the model says if I and four are dissimilar on one message in common and four and 11 are dissimilar on another message in common, I and 11 should be similar. Classic balance prediction. Classic balance prediction, okay? Um, and so we aggregate both the one step, uh, we aggregate the, uh, the two step uh, separately from the one step. The two step, the one step positive shows a po point, I'm sorry for all these numbers, uh, shows a high positive correlation to the raw PE for the group. The one step negatives, a high negative correlation. The two step positives, a less strong but positive correlation. The two step negatives, uh, a less strong but negative correlation. Um, these are not great analyses. They are very interesting, however. They're not great because we haven't done any corrections to them, um, and so they really represent raw, uh, raw levels of, of correlation. Next generation studies are, the, are, the, are two, and then I'm, I'm done. Um, right now, what we have is what are called sparse message comparisons. So. Any two people in our, our system are going to have only one or two messages in common. That's not a good basis for establishing similarity or dissimilarity. We'd really like to have that be more. That's going to take a different kind of design than we have been using. Our goal is to build a recommendation system so that a message that a person has never seen, we can anticipate the likelihood that that message will be effective for that person. Not for the population, because we can predict a lot about the population, right? 65% of the variance is pretty good. But not necessarily for that person. And so we would like to be able to carry out that, uh, that kind of prediction. One of the ways of doing it is to offer a, you know, is to get some data on people, have them go away, have them come back, and uh, give them some uh, prediction, some, some predicted successes and predicted failures. Another way to do this is to build the algorithms online so that a person once exposed to a given, a given message that uh, they evaluate can be, uh, we can use that information to adapt the algorithm right then and there and give them another one. Say, this should be a better choice for you. We see whether that's true or not and we adapt. See whether that's true and adapt, okay? Just probably just like Amazon does, just like Netflix does for you. When you say, ah, this, no way, no way. And they say, oh, how about these others? <laughs> that's what we would like to be able to, that's where we're going. So in the end, part of what we're trying to, we're trying to do is we are trying to understand how messages function, understand how they can be designed and built, and importantly, uh, how they can be designed and built, not just at the population level, which is a great place to work, but also at the, uh, at the individual level. And I think we've made good progress at the population level. I'm not sure we have, we have not made uh, great progress at the individual level, but there is that road open to us uh, to continue back to the motorcycle metaphor 
and uh, hopefully we will uh, be able to do the kinds of uh, motorcycle specific adjustments necessary to um, make this all work. I'm happy to take your questions in the next 90 seconds. <laughs>